Back in the early 80s, the Swedish armed forces were looking for a new lightly armoured vehicle with high strategic mobility, as well as the ability to carry out several battlefield roles. In 1985, Haglunds and Bofors finalised a design that would ultimately result in the CV-90 chassis. It was designed to have low ground pressure to navigate the Swedish subarctic conditions. This meant if it had great mobility in the Nordic Tiger, it would be superb in a mainly temperate European climate. As well as the chassis being incredibly mobile, the CV-90 was designed to be capable of housing several different turrets, specifically designed for different battlefield roles. At the time of recording, we currently have 5 CV-90 variants in-game. Today we will be taking a look at the Stritzforden 9040C, the Stritzforden 9056 and the LVKV904C. You also have the CV-90105, which I already have a video on, <coughs> shameless plug, <coughs> And finally, you have the CV-9120, which I will make a video on separately in the future. Starting as always with the basics, today's vehicles are all rank 6 and are located in the Swedish tech tree. Being rank 6 tech tree vehicles, they will only be effective at researching other vehicles between the ranks of 6 and 7. All of these tanks require you to grind out 250,000 research points in order to unlock them, and they all have the same cost price, as well as the same crew train cost with 690,000 silver lions and 200,000 silver lions respectively. You can then additionally purchase the expert and ace qualifications for the tanks, costing 690,000 and 2,100 golden eagles respectively. The repair cost for each vehicle does however vary, and I will cover this individually later, but none of them exceed 10,000 silver lions. Going on to the rewards, on all of these vehicles have a base RP modifier of 2.26. This gives you an RP modifier of 226 with a free to play account and 452% with a premium account. Like the repair cost, the Silver Lion modifier varies between different tanks, but the lowest is 1.3, which still gives you pretty decent rewards. Due to all these vehicles sharing the same chassis, it makes sense to start this video by covering the ways in which the vehicles are similar, before we move on to the segments exploring the unique aspects of each variant. With all of these tanks being effectively top tier vehicles, they are quite a grind away for someone just starting the Swedish tech tree. So are they worth it, and which variant should you unlock first? If you'd like to know the answers to these questions, as well as more about the vehicles, then stick around for the rest of the video. As I've repeated about 8,000 times now, these vehicles all use the same chassis, meaning they all pretty much have the same mobility and driving characteristics, with slight differences between the power to weight ratios. All of these tanks are powered by an engine producing 550 horsepower, giving each variant a power to weight ratio of at least 19 horsepower per ton. This power to weight ratio is rather low by top tier standards, especially considering most main battle tanks exceed 24 horsepower per ton. Moving on to the transmission, on all vehicles are capable of reaching a top speed of 70 km per hour. While this is impressive, we we'll hardly ever make it up to this speed, due to the low power of the engines. The CV90 chassis also has an impressive reverse speed of 45 km per hour, which allows you to beat a retreat in good time. Being a design of a NATO country, the CV-90 is naturally able to neutral steer, allowing it to turn on the spot, giving it greater manoeuvrability compared to Soviet vehicles. Overall, the mobility of these three tanks is a little bit underwhelming for top tier vehicles, especially if you are used to fighting in main battle tanks. Their low power to weight ratios do make them feel rather sluggish, and as I mentioned, the top speeds of 70km per hour are pretty much a pipe dream on 90% of the maps in War Thunder. Moving on to survivability and armoured protection, and the first thing to mention is that the Stritzford and 9040C and the Stritzford and 9056 both have a crew of 4 men, while the anti-aircraft vehicle, the LVKV 904C has a crew of 5 men. All three tanks share a similar crew placement around the vehicle, with 2 men in the turret, a driver at the front, and then additional crew members are carried at the rear of the vehicle, where the dismounted infantry will be carried. While normally this would mean pretty good survivability, being light vehicles, all three variants can be hole broken by AP FSDS rounds, as well as high caliber heat FS shells. This basically means if you're shot in a major component of the tank, such as the cannon breach or engine, you will be instantly killed. This issue is made worse by the fact that the engine of these vehicles is located at the very front of the tank. While the MacIver's front-mounted engine acts as a sponge for incoming rounds, the fact that your tank has a hull brake mechanic basically means any round hitting the front of the vehicle will damage the engine and instantly kill the tank. And if the survivability of this tank wasn't low enough, all three vehicles also have large amounts of ammunition stored in the whole floor. Like all other internal ammunition, a round penetrating your tank and hitting this ammo store will result in an explosion, also instantly killing the tank. This is par for the course in light tanks, and I wouldn't recommend taking a lower ammunition load. You're still going to die if you get shot, so you may as well go down swinging. Alright, so moving on to the actual arm performance itself, and to test this, just as always, we'll be using the 3BM42 Mango round as fired by the T-80U. 
You may have noticed, two of our vehicles have the letter C after their number designation. This is essentially telling us that they are using the third chassis upgrade. Both the Stritzford and 9040C and the LVKV 904C use a more modern chassis, featuring composite armour add-ons, whereas the Stritzford and 9056 uses the original mid-1990s armour layout, mainly consisting of road homogeneous steel. Because of these two different armour packages, I'll be doing two different armour tests. Ok, starting with the older armour of the Stritzford and 9056, and we can see that the lower glacis provides only around 24mm of armour, and moving to the upper frontal plate, the protection ranges from 64mm of armour up to around 80mm. The turret does vary in its thickness, but at its thickest, it's still only around 100mm of armour. But as you can see if I move my mouse around, you can still be easily penetrated pretty much anywhere, both on the turret and the frontal hull. Moving on to the newer Block C variants, and you will immediately notice the chunky composite armour around the front and sides of the hull and turret. The lower frontal plate provides around 90mm of effective armour, quite a bit of a jump up in protection compared to the 9056. However, it still won't be enough to save you from pretty much all top tier rounds. And it's the same story for the upper frontal plate, as the composite armour add-on doesn't really cover this area, giving around the same level of protection as the standard 1990s model. And finally, the turret armour is better, mainly due to the funky angling of the composite slabs. This isn't going to do anything against Sable rounds, but it may cause a few lucky bounces against Heater Fest shells. Again, this variant can be penetrated easily from the front, giving you no real practical armour differences between all three variants. Overall, the survivability of all CB90 variants in the game is very low. Usually, you'd use your speed as your armour with light vehicles, but as I've covered in the previous sections, you don't really have that option with these tanks. I'll go more into the battlefield role of each vehicle in the upcoming individual segments, but as a general rule, these tanks are not to be played as flankers. They don't have the speed or survivability to go off on their own. They are pretty much dedicated support vehicles. Play alongside your main battle tanks, popping out to harass the enemies they're engaging. Alright, moving on to weapons and ammunition, and all three of these vehicles are armed with the 40mm ACAN M70B cannon. This is essentially a modernised Bofors anti-aircraft gun from World War II. The biggest issue with the Bofors gun in World War II was that the ammunition could not be loaded fast enough, meaning gunners would have to fire bursts and then stop to allow the loaders to catch up. This issue has been sort of fixed with the CV-90, as its main gun features a 24 round auto loader. While this does sound like a lot of ammunition, bear in mind the M70B has a fire rate of 500 rounds per minute, only giving you a total of 5 seconds of total trigger time before your auto loader is completely empty. After firing all rounds in the auto loader, it will take 6 seconds for a single round to be loaded into the gun. After an additional 6 seconds, your auto loader will start being reloaded rapidly, taking a further 3 seconds per round. Because of this reloading system, I would never recommend holding down the trigger and totally emptying your autoloader. It's also worth noting that the autoloader is reloaded mechanically, so you don't have to be stationary. As I mentioned, the autoloader holds a total of 24 rounds, but the vehicle itself can carry 230 rounds altogether. All vehicles pretty much share the same vertical guidance characteristics, with all of the vehicles being able to depress their guns by 8 degrees and raise them in elevation to 35 degrees, with the exception of the LVKV, which being an anti-aircraft vehicle, can elevate up to 50 degrees. With a stock crew, all variants are able to traverse the turrets at a rate of 25 degrees per second, and with an ace crew, it increases to 35 degrees per second. Next we move on to the modifications, and I want to point out that all three tanks get access to a laser rangefinder, as well as third generation thermal limiting for the gunner sight, with the Stritzford and 9056 also getting third gen thermals for its commander's sight. All variants have a constant thick zoom with an 8x power, and while this is good for long range use, it becomes quite difficult to engage close range targets. Alright moving on to the ammunition, and there are 3 rounds that all variants get access to. Your stock round is the M9 to APF SDS round. This has a rather high muzzle velocity of 1465m per second, and can penetrate 143mm of flat armour, which drops down to 83mm versus armour sloped at 60 degrees. It's worth bearing in mind however, that this round only has a weight of 0.25kg, which means it has very low post penetration damage, but it does get the job done when firing into the side of a main battle tank. You also get access to a stock high explosive shell. It travels at 988 meters per second and can only penetrate 5 mm of armor. This is pretty useless in my opinion and has no practical purpose in the game after you unlock the next round we'll talk about. That round being the high explosive variable time shell. This is essentially a proximity fuse shell which will automatically detonate when close to a plane or helicopter. However, it has a minimum arming distance of 500 meters. So if a helicopter is very close to you, the round will not detonate and has led to my death several times. With that general overview complete, we'll now briefly look at each vehicle individually.
The Stritzford and 9040C is essentially the standard variant of the CV90 series. With a real-life main purpose of troop transport and support, it has no real speciality and is a dedicated gun tank. Its gun is fully stabilised at all speeds, and it has an additional type of ammunition available to it. This round is the M01 APF SDS round. Essential being an upgraded fin round, it is capable of penetrating 170mm of flat armour, a 30mm increase over the stock fin round. Apart from the additional ammunition, there isn't really anything else to say about this tank. It is completely dependent on its 40mm cannon for kills, but it cannot frontally pen any main battle tank in the game. This forces you to play in a supporting role to your own tanks. While it certainly is powerful in certain situations, it's hard to make your own plays in this vehicle. It also has the highest repair cost of 9,040 silver lions. The next tank we'll look at is the anti-aircraft version of the 9040C. This is essentially the same as the last tank we looked at, except someone got a search and track radar from IKEA and just smacked it down on top of the thing. The radar has a maximum range of 10km, but when using the HEVT rounds, it only gives you a firing solution out to a range of 3.5km. Anyone who has played helicopters during the cancerous helicopter spam knows that helicopters frequently sit several kilometres away from the battlefield. This means that the LVKV cannot engage these helicopters, so its usefulness as an anti-aircraft vehicle is rather limited. But with the vehicle also having the stock APF SDS round, as well as a full stabiliser, it can also be used in a supporting role, just like the previous vehicle. Its repair cost is slightly lower than the previous tank, at 6,547 Silver Lions. And finally, we come to the Stritz Ford and 9056. As I mentioned in the armour section, this vehicle has no letter C on its designation, as it is based on an early CV90 model. Not only does this mean you have less armour, you also have a very poor stabiliser. Whereas the previous two versions both had fully stabilised guns at all speeds, the 9056 feels very much like the early Sherman tanks. The gun is stabilised only when moving very slowly. This is really only an issue if you try and play aggressively, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, mainly due to your special weapons. The reason for this variant having the 9056 designation is due to it carrying the 56mm Bill missile. This stands for Beaufort, Infantry, Light and Lethal, and it certainly does live up to the latter. These missiles are top-down attack, meaning they fly over an enemy and detonate above them. This has positives and negatives. It means you cannot aim the missiles at precise points on an enemy. For example, if your first missile takes out people in the turret, naturally you'd want to aim your second missile at the driver's compartment. This is easy to do with regular sack loss missiles, but due to the build being automated in game, this is a bit tricky. On the flip side, the top down attack capability means you can fire at people in cover, behind ridge lines, and they are completely unable to counter this. You can carry two of these missiles in the launcher, with a further six stored in the hull of the vehicle. Just like the M3 Bradley, these missiles cannot be fired on the move. You must stop the tank and wait for around 7 seconds before the launcher fully deploys. After both rounds are fired, it will then take 22 seconds for your launcher to reload. The Stritzford and 9056 also gets third generation thermals for both the gunner and commander's sights, making it excellent for target acquisition on the battlefield. These thermals, your slow deploying missiles, as well as the lack of an effective stabiliser, means you should play this tank as a dedicated tank destroyer. Hold a strong position and wait, let enemies come to you. You can then greet them with your lethal missiles. Its repair cost sits in between the two previous tanks at 7,805 Silver Lions. To conclude, all three of these vehicles are powerful assets to the Swedish tech tree. They provide substantial power in a fairly mobile, fairly low profile tank, which all have low spawn costs. This makes them monsters in the late stage of a match where everyone has already spawned their main battle tanks and is down to their IFVs and anti-aircraft vehicles. However, at the start of a match, their usefulness is substantially lower. The main cannon on these tanks cannot reliably knock out enemies from the front, and their pretty low mobility doesn't allow you to perform any early game flanking maneuvers to put shots into the weak sides of hostile tanks. Due to this, I wouldn't recommend taking out any of these vehicles as a first spawn, but I would recommend you all grind them. I've talked a lot about their shortcomings, but there are a lot of positives. Starting with lineups, 
And with the vehicles all being around Battle Racing 10.0, they match up perfectly alongside the Stritzwagen 121. You can take this tank out as your first spawn, and if you happen to die, you can fall back on these tanks. And due to the lineup being Battle Racing 10.0, you do get the occasional down tier to 9.0. Even in a full up tier, these tanks are perfectly capable of being effective on the battlefield, and your lineup is made even better if you have the Stritzwagen 122. If I had to rank these vehicles, then the Stritz 4 and 9040C would definitely come last. Its improved APFSDS round still has the exact same issues as the early round found on the two other tanks. And the additional features of the LVKV and the 9056 make the base Stritz Ford a bit redundant. It's a bit of a toss up between the LVKV and the 9056. The latter loses the stabiliser but gains incredibly effective top down attack missiles, allowing you to play as a deadly tank destroyer. It does have its downsides, such as a low deployment of the missiles and the aforementioned stabiliser, but when played in a defensive tank destroying position, it is insanely powerful. And finally, the LVKV 9040C probably the best all-round variant of the three. It's essentially a copy of the Stritz Ford and 9040C. It has all the best elements, with the only drawback being the lack of the late APFSDS round. But with the addition of the search and track radar, you have an incredibly effective close-range anti-aircraft vehicle, as well as a deadly support tank. If you are interested in grinding out the Swedish tech tree, then I'd suggest first going for the main battle tank line. Get the Stritzwagen 121, and then consider which of these vehicles suits you best. If you can only be asked to grind one, however, then I'd suggest the LVKV. But it's important to remember that this is just my opinion. What do you guys think about these Swedish miniguns? If you have any questions, criticism, positive or negative, I would even like to request a review. Please feel free to leave a comment below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was a little bit long, but if I did my job correctly, hopefully you should have learned something new about these vehicles. If you do enjoy these sorts of videos, please do consider leaving a like and subscribing. But most importantly, lads, I hope you have a great day and thank you very much for watching.